Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Third chapter of Jeremiah. Uh, whoever divided the Bible up into chapters was not only uninspired, they were somewhat ignorant. <laughs> Because they did a terrible job at some places in the Bible dividing that thing up. I agree that it's somewhat helpful having our, our Bibles divided up into chapters and verse, but it often causes more problems than it helps. Because uh, chapter 2 and 3 and the first few verses of chapter 4 are a literary unit. They ought to go together. They deal with the same subject matter. And I think when, we, when our eye sees that chapter division, we automatically make a, a, a break in our minds. And uh, so if you can somehow remember back last week when we talked about chapter 2 and about how they were turning from God and turning away and playing the harlot both spiritually and physically, and then chapter 3 will fit right into that uh, immediate context of chapter 2. Now, in chapter 3 it says, God says, If a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not the land be completely polluted? Now, this is a reflection of Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Now, this is where Jesus picks up on about writing, uh, when the Pharisees and all asking about, uh, Moses let them write a bill of divorcement, and this is the passage, okay? Now, the context here is not really dealing with the issue of divorce. It's dealing with uh, the issue of God's people going after other gods, which is considered spiritual adultery because God is considered to be the husband of his people. Now, maybe that's a good place probably where the ideal of Jesus uh, and the church being his bride is an analogous relationship in the New Testament. And so in the Septuagint, when it says, will he return to her? Now that follows the Masoretic text best. But really, uh, we're, we're not really dealing with divorce. We're dealing with a people going from God. And so the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation done around a couple of hundred B.C., it puts, can she return to him? Now, that fits better the whole context. And um, does he, will he return to her? Fits better the context in Deuteronomy, but doesn't fit the context here. We're talking about God's people going away and coming back. And what God is saying is, if you've gone away from me and attached yourselves to other gods, uh, the law would say you couldn't come back to me. But I want to show you how much I love you and that even after you've done that to me, I'm willing to take you back. Now, it's almost a picture of Gomer and Hosea, isn't it? As Gomer went off into adultery and God told Hosea to take her back. And so here's the picture we're dealing with here. Now the question is, and we'll see in the first few verses, that Israel and Judah are going to be spoken of separately. Here, the northern ten tribes, the southern two tribes... The northern ten tribes are already gone into captivity. They were taken off into captivity in 722 B.C. by Sargon II. There's a few uh, remaining people up there who are Jews, but mostly are imports from other captured countries. The Assyrian policy of keeping subjected people under subjection was to transport them from their homeland and, and resettle them somewhere else. And uh, it was political pressure on Judah and not spiritual repentance that caused Judah to begin uh, hollering out for God to help her. And so that is basically verses 1 and 2. When it says, will not the land be completely polluted? Uh, this is the idea that we get from Deuteronomy 24 again, that adultery or abomination of a man taking back his former wife after she had married someone else affects the whole land. And let me give you some verses. There are many verses in the Old Testament that deal that the land is affected by the morality of the people that live there. Exodus, uh, excuse me, Leviticus 18, 24 through 28, Leviticus 19, 29, and of course, Deuteronomy 24, 4. 
And that deals with the fact that the land suffers from our sin. Now, there's a good New Testament verse on that. Anybody know offhand where that is? Romans 8, 17 and following, 18 and following, about that the, the earth groans uh, right now to the revealing of the sons of God. Now, notice where it mentions here. Then it's going to talk about lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see where have you not been violated by the roads you have set for them like an Arab in the desert. You have polluted the land with your harlotry and your wickedness. Now, you've got to have a little background here or I think it's going to take you a long time to see what God's doing. Let me pick up one little thought in verse 1 where it says, You were a harlot with many lovers. The idea of God as husband and his people as wife, I think goes back initially to the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 10, 20, where the word cleave, that we need to cleave to God, is used. And that's the same word that's used in Genesis 2, 24 for a husband and wife cleaving to one another. And so I think there's a, a Pentateuchal background to this concept. Now, where it says bare heights, what we're talking about is mountains with no vegetation on top. Now, one or two things are happening. They're rocky kind of hills where nothing would grow anyway. Or it may be there's so many idolaters up there worshiping Baal that they've worn all the grass down. And they're just bare now. But it is a word that's used for the high places of idolatry. You might want to see Hosea. Um, forgot what verse that is in Hosea. I've got it mentioned later. I'll have to find it then. Okay, the, the one I was looking for is uh, 11 through 14 of some chapter. I think it's 14, 11 through 14. Does that fit? Okay, 4, 11 through 14. Okay. Now, Baal worship, they felt like the higher they could get up, the closer they were to God. Now, what other historical occurrence of that kind of theology have we found in the Bible? The higher you get up, the closer you are to God. What other occurrence? Tower of Babel. And also the ziggurats, or the, uh, where they uh, look at the stars and all of Babylon and Sumeria and all of that. So it's a, a matter of fact, for a long time, God was considered to be a mountain God, wasn't he? Because he met Moses at Mount Sinai and, and on and on. So it seems like the theology of that day is the higher you got, the closer you were to God. And so all these altars of Baal and Ashtoreth were placed on the top of these hills. And that's where we get the, these barren heights. Now it says a little sarcasm here on the part of Jeremiah. Where have you not been violated? <laughs> He's saying, uh, is there a mountain or a tree or a rock around here that you haven't polluted with your adultery? Uh, fertility worship is a pretty lewd kind of worship. And knowing man the way you do, you think you'd be attracted to it? Yeah. Then it says, by the roads you have set for them. Now remember the story of Tamar in Genesis uh, thirty-eight fourteen where she played like she was a harlot because uh, Judah wouldn't let his other son marry her. Remember that whole story of the count? Well, apparently that was a common practice of harlots sitting by the road or sitting on the street corners. You might want well to see Proverbs chapter 7, verses 12 and following, or Ezekiel 16, 25, for these same accounts of uh, the practice of prostitutes in that day. Now, the next little verse is kind of hard to understand. It says, like an Arab in the desert. Now, the Septuagint has like a raven in the desert, and the consonants are just the same. You don't change any consonants. You just change the vocalization of them to get raven or Arab. Most commentators see this as a reflection of the Bedouin tendency to ambush caravans or or, or people who are traveling. As they get so excited about uh, robbing somebody... So Israel gets excited about going after other gods. That seems to be somewhat the analogy. Now in verse 3. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and there have been no spring rains. Yet you had a, a harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. Now, in Palestine there are two rainy seasons. There's an early rain and a latter rain. You might want to see Deuteronomy eleven fourteen for both of them, but... For crops to grow, you have to have the early one to plant and the late one to mature. And both are needed. So it quit raining. Here is a theological expression that God often uses nature 
to turn people back to himself. Would you buy that? Have you ever seen the... Well, you know, we talk about missiles and how much power they have. Do you know how much power nature displayed when it blew and atomized a quarter mile of solid rock on top of Mount St. Helens? There was a lot of atom bombs involved in atomizing that quarter mile of that mountain. And just think of the power of volcanoes or of tornadoes. I want to tell you, nature is awesome. And God uses the forces of nature many times to turn people's hearts back to himself. Um, but it didn't work here. They didn't listen. They wouldn't come back to him. And then he mentions this word about you have a harlot's forehead. Well, golly, that takes little understanding. <laughs> Does that mean you... It, your forehead shaped funny or, you know, that you have a little neon sign up there. It says, you know. Well, there's two possible biblical reasons for this. Now, when I say biblical, I'm going to try to give you a verse that it probably can refer to. And that's where I'm going to try to base what I say. It may be a certain ornamentation that prostitutes would wear on their forehead that would identify her as a prostitute. Is there? Do you remember any place in the Bible that it talks about... A prostitute having something on her forehead? When I tell you, you're going to say, oh, yeah. It's the prostitute of Babylon in the book of the Revelation, chapter 17, verse 5, that has the mark on her forehead. And the other thing I think it probably means, if it's a biblical meta metaphor for stubbornness or uh, not listening or being ashamed. We find that in Ezekiel 3. Seven and eight, so it's it's one of those. Uh, context seems to talk about it, referring to being ashamed. Uh, verse four. Have you not just now called to me, my father? Thou art the friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Now here they're calling on God. Jeremiah's kind of trying to put words in their mouth of what they would say to God. The rains have stopped. They're getting political pressure. They're going to say, God, you've been my friend and helper since I was a youth. And so they're going back to their Sunday school days and trying to pick up on all the names and titles of God that they were taught as children. And they say something like, will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? They were saying, it's God's business to forgive. God will forgive anybody. That's just what he does. Now, I want to show you something. The, when it says here, will he be angry forever, the implication of the context is he will. But notice if you skip down to verse 12, the very same phrase is used by God in a forgiving way where it says, I will not be angry forever. What's the difference? Attitude. The attitude of one was, oh, God will forgive. And the attitude of the other people... Oh, will God forgive? If the attitude of the person is contrite and repentant, God will forgive. If the attitude of the person is shallow, deceptive, words only, no, he won't. He really won't. Now, here is uh, what Jeremiah says in response to this little uh, uh, dialogue here. He says, Behold, you have spoken... And have done evil things, and you have had your way. Jeremiah is reflecting, I think, the words of Isaiah 29, verse 3, when it says, These people come near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What Jeremiah is saying is, you've spoken some beautiful words, but your lifestyle shows that your words are a lie. Friend, I think one of the greatest problems in the church today is that most people who do not know our Savior... When they see a Christian play the hypocrite, they automatically write off Christianity. We need to talk and walk or speak and live the same. That was their problem here. Outwardly, this is the Josiah reform. The temple was full. Sacrifices were being offered. I'm sure that the temple choir was packed, singing the beautiful anthems, people flooding to the temple. And Jeremiah stood in all of the middle of that religiosity and said, This is the pits. A lot of commotion. Very little heart attitude. Now, beginning in verse 6, we have a dialogue between Yahweh and Jeremiah in verses 6 through 11. 
And the dialogue goes like this. The Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what the faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was, she was a harlot there. Now, this is where Hosea 4, 11 through 14 uh, described. Now, Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. They play, the reason they went up on, under the trees is they didn't want to get sunburned. <laughs> you catch what I'm saying? I mean, if you, you know, if, if you're going to make love outside, find a tree. That's what they did. Every tree. Can you imagine the lewdness of Israeli society in the northern kingdom? I don't think you can. We think our places open up. You, you've never, you can't imagine what a fertility worshiping culture is. Uh, they even gave their daughters and their wives to the worship of these of the fertility gods, Baal and Ashtaroth. And notice in verse 7, by the way, the word Israel here is obviously referring to the northern ten tribes. It's not talking about all the people of God, the northern ten tribes. Verse 7. And I thought after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherousness, treacherous sister Judah saw it. Israel and Judah are depicted as twin sisters. And the whole thought through here, here is, Judah should have seen what I did to Israel when I took her into captivity by Assyria. But Judah did not listen, and Judah has greater sin because she saw what would happen, and she continued in her rebellion. And that's the general thought through here. Notice Judah, of course, the southern two tribes. Now, notice in verse 8 where it says, and I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, and she went and was a harlot also. Now, sent her away is, is kind of saying that God allowing Assyria to take the northern ten tribes into exile was God's way of breaking the covenant or a way of saying, I divorce you, I send you away. The covenant between us is broken. Now, the reason I think the Bible depicts God as a husband and Israel and Judah as his wives, there is no more intimate relationship in all of man's understanding than the relationship between husband and wife. They know each other better than anybody else knows them. That is the relationship between God and his people. The same analogy is used of why God is called Father in these same chapters. And the intimate relationship between a Hebrew father and his children, the emphasis this culture placed on the family was one of the most intimate relationships, and that's why God is chosen as Father. Okay? It has nothing to do with sexuality. It has everything to do with intimate relationships in the family. Okay? Now, um, okay, and then verse 9. And it came about because of the lightness of her harlotry. Now, this word lightness is usually translated, um, I've forgotten how it's usually translated. I think it, this is the only place it's translated like this. I think it means that they, they made uh, lightness or, or made their harlotry insignificant. They, said, they would say, something, well, Israel did it. Everybody's doing it. Uh, the Canaanites do it. It can't be all that bad a thing. And what God's saying is they made little or made lightness of their uh, physical adulteries and their spiritual adultery. Okay? Made little of it. Made it of no consequence. That kind of thing. Uh, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Now, you tell me what that means. If you were here for chapter 2... You ought to know what stones and trees mean. You might want to see chapter 2, verse 27. What are we referring to? Stones and trees. Yeah? Remember which, which? Right. The, the set-up stone was Baal, the male fertility god. The, the little it was a living tree or a pole, a carved pole, we're not sure. But it was set next to Baal as his consort, and that was Ashtaroth. And so what he's saying here is that um, literally and figuratively, you have made trees and rocks your God. Now, not only is that 
talk about going after other gods, but here's a physical representation of God, a God that doesn't act, respond. It's almost ludicrous if you think about it. If it wasn't so tragic, it would be. They've made God, they made rocks and trees their gods. Um, verse 10. And yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception declares the Lord. Now this probably, when it says return to me, did not return to me with all her heart, may be a reference to the reform that was started by Hezekiah, the daddy of Manasseh, or the reform that was started by Josiah, the son of Manasseh. Which it is, we don't know, but neither one of them took. Now, the kings were very committed to it, but it, the people did not uh, fully go after it. They went after it in a sense to appease the government, but there wasn't a heart response to God. And so it was a, it was a fake reform. It was an outward religiosity that happened. A lot more biblical words were being used and a lot more cultic things were going on, but God knew their hearts and their hearts were not committed to him. Um, it says, but rather in deception, they said one thing, they felt another, and God knew it. Now, um, let's see. Okay, verse 11. And the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself more treacherous, more righteous than her treacherous Judah. Now, what's he saying? Well, he said the same thing. I can make an analogy biblically for when, when Jesus said something about uh, Nazareth and Capernaum. He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the works that you saw, they would have not had happened to them what happened to them. You are going to have stricter judgment on Judgment Day than Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, what he's saying about Israel and Judah is Israel played the fool. And she reaped what she sowed. But you, Judah, you watched that and you didn't learn from it. And your sin is greater and your responsibility is greater because she set the precedent and you didn't heed. Okay? Um, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say... Now, here is Hosea. I mean, here is Jeremiah preaching to the north, what's left of the northern tribes. And there were... Uh, some uh, remnant of this northern tribe still in the land. Uh, you see, Jeremiah came from Anathoth, which is in the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin is related to the Rachel tribes to the north. So he had a great love. Besides, during the Josiah reform, Josiah tried to include the northern tribes in his reform and worship at Jerusalem. And so it fits very nicely historically here. Toward the north would, of course, speak of the survivors of the Assyrian captivity. Um, return, faithless Israel. I, there's a play on words here. Turn, you turning ones. They had turned so much, God was saying, turn back to me. This whole chapter is a play on the Hebrew word for turn, which is S-H-U-B or V. Shub or shove. And it means turn. Turn to something, turn away from something. It can mean either one. But it's a play all the way through here on this words. Turn, you ever-turning ones, is, is kind of the idea here, declares the Lord. I will look upon you and will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord, and I will not be angry forever. Now, Jeremiah is usually a prophet that just preached doom. That's why it's called a weeping prophet. But here's a beautiful picture of using the prophetic pattern as preaching doom and hope if they repent. And so he's holding out to the northern ten tribes who most of them are in captivity and a few left in the land. He's saying, if you'll turn back to God, God will restore you. He'll, re he'll bring you back. He'll forgive you. Now, the word gracious in my translation, for I, am a, for I am gracious, is the wonderful covenant word hesed. I usually translate it God's unconditional, no strings attached, covenant faithfulness. And here he's using that special word between him and his people again with faithless Israel. When it says, I will not be angry forever, I would almost paraphrase that as God saying, I won't hold a grudge against you. I won't keep, keep a Watergate tape on your sins. When I forgive you, if you'll turn back to me, I'll wipe your white as snow. That's what he's talking about. Now, in verse 13, only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and you have scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree, 
and you have obeyed, not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Well, of course, the thing, the prerequisite for God's forgiveness is repentance. I really feel like we, have, we preach an awful cheap gospel usually. We usually preach something like, only believe, only believe. And we even have the prayers written out that you can pray, you know. And just, just pray us a little prayer and it'll all be wrong. Right. No. Wrong. Zero. The Bible speaks very clearly. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There is as much a turning from something in salvation as there is a turning to something in salvation. And we must remember that we're not talking about just feeling sorry for acts or the consequences of things we've been caught in. There is a change of lifestyle, commitment, and direction involved in repentance. We're saying, I am starting now and I will continue to walk in this way. Christianity and biblical faith is primarily not a decision, but a lifestyle. We've emphasized one part of a two-part truth. And we need to get back to the fact that biblical faith is a costly lifestyle. Okay, so God says, acknowledge your iniquity. Admit, repent, confess. The word confess in the New Testament in 1 John 1, 9 is the word homologeo. It means to say the same thing as. It has no sense of sorrow there. It is that we admit to God that we know that we have violated what he wants for our lives. That's what confession means. An honestly admitting that we have violated God's plan and God's will for our lives. Verse 14. Return, O faithless sons. Here's the metaphor again, as God is Father. You saw it up in verse 4. Declares the Lord. And I'm going to re reinterpret this, last, this next phrase for you. For I myself am a husband to you. Now, you probably have the word master, don't you, in verse 14? Does anybody have husband? What, is, what translation, Judy? New International has husband. Anybody else have anything else? Yes. Married? What translation is that? King James has married? Well, I think it... See, this, this is a play on the word Baal. Now, the name Baal is, of course, the name for the male fertility god, but it means master, lord, husband. It can mean all those things. And here, God, God is saying, and the I is emphatic, I myself am your Baal, not that Baal. I am your husband. Not that fertility cult. Okay? And I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. What's God saying? Jeremiah is the one who's going to start emphasizing the individual aspect of the covenant of God. Now, many other prophets have emphasized the corporate aspect. If there's anything that Americans do understand of the Bible, it's the corporate aspect of salvation. We're so individualistic, we very seldom see the the larger picture of the family. Jeremiah emphasized the individuality. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31, 34, emphasized the... In God saying, if there's just one of you in a city or two of you in a family, I'll respect your faith and your repentance and I'll bring you back to the land. So there's a tremendous promise based on the individual and not on the family or tribe or nation. Verse 15. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. Now, the word shepherds, of course, uh, is a word that speaks of either civil leaders or uh, religious leaders. It can mean both here. And when it says, after my own heart, that was the phrase that's used for what great Israeli king? David. A man after my own heart. Some other kings are called that. And so they're going back to David here, uh, um, uh, talking about a shepherd after my own heart. Notice they'll feed them uh, knowledge and understanding. In verse 16, And it shall be in those days, what days? The days of the new covenant. The days of the individual emphasis on repentance. I would say Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. I would say New Testament oriented. Then you will be multiplied and increased in the land. That's a, that's a messianic promise coming and going. The promise to Abraham, 
This idea of being multiplied, being prosperous, is just a sign of the Messiah, the Messianic age. Now, and then it says, declares the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Now, what, now that doesn't sound very radical to us, but if you were Jeremiah and the, and the temple cultus was going full blast in Jerusalem, and you walked in the temple, it would be like me coming in here some night and saying, before you die, there won't be a church left in the United States. Everyone will be burned to the ground, and we'll be worshiping in caves and forests. Now, would that shock you? <laughs> would that perk your ears up? That's the same kind of thing when Jeremiah walked in the temple and said, the Ark of the Covenant will be emphasized no more. Why, man, that was the center place. That's where God dwelt symbolically between the wings of the cherubim. That's where the high priest entered on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Leviticus 16, once a year for the sins of the people. That's where they met God. That was the symbol, the presence of God. And Jeremiah says, we'll be no more. Now, whether it is already gone, and we're talking about a post-exilic period for Judah, or whether he's speaking in metaphors, I don't know. And uh, nobody else knows either. But uh, that was a, boy, that just must have hit them right upside the head. Notice what he did, though. He didn't say God's presence was going to be gone completely. He's saying he's going to refocus his presence from the Ark of the Covenant to look what? This would be surprising, I think, to you. And it shall not come into mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they miss it, nor shall it be made again. Okay? At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it for the name of the Lord in Jerusalem, nor shall they walk any more after the stubbornness of their own evil heart. Friends, what's happened is the throne of God symbolized between those two cherubim, the mercy seat, has been changed from a little bitty wooden box to the entire city of Jerusalem. Now, what biblical uh, chapter does that seem to reflect? Revelation 21, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, the city of God, the people of God. We have transferred now from the cultus of Israel to a city that's big enough, what? For all the peoples of the world. This is the universal element, if you please. Um, all the Gentiles are going to be included here. Now, notice verse 18. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. Uh, all through the Old Testament, the, the splitting of the kingdoms between Jeroboam and Rehoboam after Solomon's death is considered to be a sin. And the, the time is put out in the future where they will be reunited again and God will be their God again and it won't be split. Let me give you a few references. Isaiah eleven twelve, 12, Ezekiel 37, 16 through 28. Hosea 3, 5, and Micah 2, 12. Okay? And, the, and they will come together from the land of the north to a land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. Now, many folks have said, oh, it's a nation to the north. No. No, it's not. They're going to return from captivity is the picture. And the only way to return from captivity in Assyria and captivity in Babylon was to go up the Fertile Crescent and down into Palestine. That was the natural trade route. You couldn't cut across the desert, no water. So the natural route in and out, the natural route of armies and the natural route of returning exiles and the natural route of everybody is from the north coming into Palestine, unless you're in Egypt. And that's what's the reflection here. Now, verse 19. Then I, by the way, verse 19 and following is a beautiful, beautiful picture. It's almost like... Jeremiah is wishing they would say this, but he knows they won't. It's almost like a little drama that he's written up that he wishes the people would be caught up in, but, but they won't. Then I said, how I would set you among my sons. You might want to see Hosea 11.1. 1, and give you the, a pleasant land, the, most, the beautiful of beautifuls of the nations. And I said, you shall call me my father, and do not turn away from following me. Oh, what, that's what should have been said. But here's what was said. Surely a woman treacherously departs from her lover, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. 
Jeremiah wishes this would have been the prayer. But in actuality, it was something else. And in verse 21, he continues, A voice is heard on the bare heights, and weeping and supplication of the sons of Israel, because they have perverted their ways and have forgotten the Lord their God. Now, what is the high places, the bare heights? What's done up there? Worship of the fertility gods, right? Now, watch this beautiful, beautiful matter just switch in with one pen of this prophet's hands. He hears a sound. And the sound he hears is not the sounds of the fertility worship, but he hears the sounds of mourning and crying and weeping. And lo and behold, the sounds of weeping are coming from the very bare mountains where the fertility gods were worshipped. But you see what we've done? We have the same place but a brand new tune. He hears the sound of repentance coming. He hears the sound of crying. And a good parallel is Judges 11.37. From the very place where they strayed from him is the very place they're turning back to him. A sound of supplication and weeping is heard, okay? Uh, And then he goes on. Return, O faithless sons, and I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Surely the hills are deception, a tumult on the mountains. Surely in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Now, boy, it sounds like that what we have here is an ideal repentance, that something has happened in the nation, that they're, they're repenting, they're turning, they're saying these beautiful things. But from the first part of chapter 4, we know that at best, it's a shallow repentance. And what it probably is, is a literary device to say, oh, if you only would, but you wouldn't. Look at what he said, has him say, the heels are deception. What does that mean? There's nothing in Baal worship for me. They're saying, we tried that, that bag, that didn't work. We tried those gods, that didn't work. It's a deception, it's a fraud, it's vanity. And then he goes on to say, a tumult on the mountains. Now, I think King James has an orgy on the mountains, doesn't it, King James? I'm I'm in the second part of verse 23. Somebody have King James? Orgy on the mountains. The word here does not so much speak of sexual orgy as it does of a tumult or a, a bunch of rustling and noise and a bustly activity. And exactly what it refers to is probably all, all that's associated with the worship of these fertility gods. Uh, salvation's not on the top of mountains. It's in, it's in, it's in the Lord, is what they're saying. B- verse 24. But the shameful thing has consumed the labor of our fathers since our youth, their flocks, their herds, their sons, and their daughters. Now, in the Bible, the shameful thing is a, is a play on words to the God of Baal. Let me give you the verses. Jeremiah eleven thirteen, Hosea nine ten. So we're talking about the Baal worship still. Now notice what notice what this what this false religion had done. It had consumed their fathers. It had consumed their flocks. It had consumed the produce of their land. It had consumed their children. It had consumed the, uh, their wives. Now what's that talking about? If you look at Hosea four eleven through fourteen, you'll get the sexual implication of the problems it caused in the family unit. If you also look at, at Jeremiah 7:31, you'll see that they even offered their firstborn child to the god Molech in the valley of Topheth, which we know as the valley of the sons of Hinnon. These, these Hebrews even sacrificed their firstborn child to these fertility gods. Golly, think about that. Think about the extent of their commitment to these fertility gods. Those of you who have newborn children, do you think you could stand to place that newborn infant in the hands of a fire god and watch him burn? Watch her burn? Verse 25. Let us lie down in our shames. Play on words again. Let our humiliation cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, since our youth, even to this day. It's no new thing. It was a lifestyle for them. They'd been doing it all their lives. 
And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Now, that's where chapter 3 stops. The context goes on through chapter 4 where it says it's a false repentance. These are beautiful words, but you don't really mean them. And so that's the end of chapter 3. Questions and comments? Anybody? Yes, Mike? Yes. Okay, some, if you look at ver question number four in discussion questions, does verse 20, 19 through 25 reflect the future or post-exilic? Some would see this uh, as being fulfilled in the uh, coming back and rebuilding of Jerusalem under Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, those guys. Uh, personally, because of this, new, this Jerusalem being the throne of God, and in those days, little phrase, uh, I would see it being uh, a future orientation more. But I sure couldn't be dogmatic on that. Um, as you know, the, the ten northern tribes were lost. They were completely amalgamated into the people they were deported to. Very few, if any, came back with the southern two tribes 70 years. Could you see, they went in 722 B.C., Judah went in 586, 150 years plus. And then 70 years after that's when Judah got to come home. Well, that time, we had 200 years plus of amalgamation in Assyria and amalgamation back in Samaria. That's why the Jews hated the Samaritans so bad, because they considered them half-breeds. They had interbred so much with the imported people, they didn't consider them Jews anymore. That's why they hated them so bad. So I, I don't really know. I, it could be post-exilic, I guess, but it seems to be a future thing because of the rest of the context to me. Lord, we can't imagine tonight how far your people could get to you that they could worship these fertility gods in such horrendous ways. And yet, Lord, I know in my heart tonight that as far as we have come as a culture from you is no lesser sin than the sin of Israel. God, we've replaced, replaced the fertility gods with many other gods in our culture. And often the society we live in is an abomination to you and an affront to who you are. God, help us to realize how far we've come from the kind of people you want us to be. And give us the commitment, we pray, to live lives that stand out for you in a culture that does not know you except in name. As Israel had much religiosity, O Lord, I see much popular religion in our country. But, O God, as it was an empty shell, so I see an empty shell in our day. Might we return to you in love and commitment not of part of our lives, O Lord, but of all of our being, all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen.